Chapter 7 A Present for Pee-wee Tommy Turner was in high spirits when he left for school on Wednesday morning. The previous night, he'd been told by Mrs. Cameron at the library that he was going to be getting a dime an hour raise for his job as page in the reference wing. According to his calculations, that added up to a buck fifty a week, six dollars a month, and seventy-two extra dollars a year. Mad money, money to burn. Hell, if things turned out sweet at Porky's, he'd be able to go there a couple times a year, just on the extra cash he'd be earning. Yes, sirree, things were looking up for Tommy Turner. It was shaping up to be a scorcher outside, and on his way to school, Tommy drove with his window down, singing along with the radio and tapping his fingers on the roof. What a day to be alive, he thought. In the back of his mind, he was already gearing up for the weekend. Visions of Cuban nymphomaniacs danced in his head. He couldn't wait. Maybe he'd get to have two of them to himself. As he crossed over a bridge near the deadbeat diner, Tommy glanced out at the field set back a few dozen yards from the road where the gang's favorite swimming hole lay shimmering in the sunlight. A frown slowly creased his brow. He turned off the road and drove down a set of twin dirt ruts that led across the bumpy field to the water hole. Another car with Massachusetts plates on the rear bumper was already parked there. Smoke rose from a campfire set near the water's edge, and three sleeping bags were laid out on the dirt, but nobody was in them. Out in the middle of the large pond, three young men were whooping it up, treading water and joking back and forth. Tommy put his car in neutral, stepped on the parking brake and watched the others until they spotted him. Then he smiled and waved to them. Morning, he called out cheerily. Howdy, one of the swimmers shouted back as he continued to tread water. Nice day, isn't it? Yeah, sure is, Tommy said. Water's nice and warm, another one said. The third man found a boulder resting on the bottom of the pond and stood on it so that his head and shoulders were above the water line. He waved his arms above his head and shrieked, Look, Ma, no hands! The first guy called out to Tommy, We're just down visiting from Boston. We figured we'd camp out here, save a few bucks. Tommy nodded, still smiling. That's no problem, is it? The first man said dog paddling lazily toward the bank. I mean, we won't get in trouble staying here, will we? Well, Tommy called out, I guess if Henry hasn't bothered you yet, you're probably all right. Henry, the man on the rock shouted. Who's Henry? Henry's an alligator, Tommy explained innocently. He prefers the pond here to the swamps. Tommy shifted his car into reverse and waved to the men from Massachusetts who were suddenly quiet and still in the water as they looked around them frantically. Bye, Tommy shouted, leaving them behind. By the time he reached the road, 
He had to stop until he could bring his laughter under control. The rest of the way to school, he quizzed himself on history dates, preparing for a big test during third period. It was the only class he figured he'd have any trouble getting an A in, and he needed a top grade to keep his average up. By his figures, he was only a few percentage points ahead of Marvin Brode in terms of being class salutatorian. He wanted the honor badly, not so much for its scholastic importance, but because for over a year now, he'd been working on a comedy routine he hoped he'd be able to give in place of a speech during graduation ceremonies in June. Beth Ann Robart's father owned the biggest radio station in Angel Beach, and Tommy figured that if he could make an impression on the old man, he might be able to get a job with the station. He'd end up being a disc jockey by the time he graduated from college, and who could tell? Maybe he'd get Beth Ann thrown into the bargain. When he reached school and parked, Tommy reached under the seat and pulled out a brown paper bag covering something the size of a small takeout pizza container. Smirking to himself, he sandwiched the parcel between his books, then got out and waved happily to Marvin on his way to join the other students mingling in front of school. A blur of motion on the rooftop caught his attention, and Tommy looked up to see two of Wendy's closest friends crouched near the edge of the roof, just above the main entrance. They were a dozen feet apart, and each one held a length of rope connected to the Beat Green Acre City banner flapping slightly over the doorway. He couldn't figure out why they were looking at him so closely, much less what they were doing up there in the first place. He looked around until he spotted Wendy talking with Mickey and Billy. Hey, Wendy, Tommy called out as he walked toward her. What's Rita and Phyllis doing up on the roof? Noticing Tommy for the first time, Wendy broke out smiling, looked up to her friends, and nodded her head. Up on the rooftop, Rita and Phyllis let go of the ropes. The banner abruptly fell forward, but it was still secured from the bottom, so that it was the backside that was now visible to the students. Oh, shit, Tommy groaned. In large, bold letters, the backside of the banner read, Tommy Turner, Wit, A-, minus, Pecker, B+, plus, Endurance, D, Shoes, A+. Plus. Oh, shit, Tommy groaned again. Wendy strolled over to him and jeered, As ye reap, so shall ye sow, Tommy Turner. Cruel, Tommy told her. Over near the entrance, he saw Meat and Tim jumping up to pull the banner down amidst a lively chorus of laughs and retorts from the female portion of the student population. Tommy could feel a thousand eyes on him. He did his best to go along with the joke, grinning at Wendy. <laughs> Touché! Wendy opened her notebook and pulled out a sheet of paper, handing it back to Tommy. Here, we're even. Hey, wait a minute, Tommy said, as he snatched his top ten survey and quickly pocketed it. That wasn't the deal. What about this little goodie I bought for you? Tommy pulled the package out from between his books. Wendy looked at it and said, you're kidding. You actually found one? I told you I did, Tommy said. Don't you believe me when I tell you something? Where'd you get it? A place in Fort Myers, Tommy said, taking the flat box out of its bag. You know, one of those joke stores. As Mickey and Billy crowded around, Tommy pried the top off the box and revealed what looked to be a gigantic, flesh-colored balloon. Beautiful, Wendy said. It's perfect. Look, I'll split you 50-50 for it, okay? What the hell is it? Mickey wondered. Wendy took it out of the box and let it dangle from her hands. One end was rounded and the other was open, like a rubber turtleneck. Holy shit, Billy exclaimed. It's a 10-gallon condom. It looks like Godzilla's rubber, Mickey remarked. What's it for? Billy asked. 
Wendy looked over his shoulder and gasped. Oh, oh, here he comes. She hid the overgrown rubber behind her back and let a warm smile wash across her face as she walked past Pee-wee, who just arrived at school. They traded glances, then Pee-wee looked wonderingly at Tommy. What's with Wendy? Gee, I don't know, Pee-wee. Goofy broad, Pee-wee said, as Meat and Tim came over, carrying the wadded-up banner between them. Pee-wee told the guys, Listen, you guys aren't going to believe this great new way I figured out to get your rocks off. Oh, God, not another Pee-wee special, Mickey grimaced. Is this another chop liver and knot hole number? No, Pee-wee insisted. Really, this is great. Guaranteed to drive you wild. First thing you do is catch three flies in a jar. Flies, Billy said dubiously. Let me finish, Pee-wee complained. You catch the flies, and then you take some honey, and you get in the bathtub, and you fill the tub halfway, and then you lie on your back with your cock poking up out of the water. Hey, me, this the one you were trying out the other night? Tommy asked. Pee-wee ignored the interruption and continued. Then what you do is spread honey on your cock and let the flies loose, so they'll go for it. Oh, man, it's wild. Sick, Billy said sadly, putting a hand over Pee-wee's forehead. Poor boy will be lucky to make it through the end of the week. Hey, knock it off, Pee-wee said, pushing Billy's hand away. I'm telling you guys, this is heaven on earth I'm talking about. Man, all those tiny little fly feet caressing your dork. I ought to take out a patent on this. You aren't telling us you actually tried this, Mickey said. Of course I did. I don't believe it, Mickey said. Why not? How'd you manage to fit three whole flies in the end of your cock? Hey, man, Pee-wee fumed, surrounded by laughter. He didn't see Wendy come up to him until she called his name. He looked at her suspiciously and asked, Yeah, what do you want, Wendy? She still had her hands behind her back and was still smiling strangely at him. I have something for you. Oh, yeah? What? It's, uh... Wendy looked around at the others, who were already starting to crack up. It's kind of like a trophy. What are you talking about? A trophy for you. A trophy? I didn't get it. What for? For being the biggest dickhead I ever went out with, Wendy announced. She held the giant condom out for everyone to see before dramatically handing it to Pee Wee. Speech, Billy called out, leading the others and applauding the presentation. Hey, forget it, you guys, Pee Wee said, refusing to take the present. I don't need this grief. Pee-wee turned and started to walk off. Wendy took hold of the condom's open end, ran up behind Pee-wee, and crowned him with it. It was a perfect fit and wrapped so snugly around his head that the trapped air slightly inflated the condom. He sure looks like a dickhead, all right, Tommy observed. Pee-wee tugged at the rubber until it came off his head. Then he threw it angrily at Tommy. Tommy caught it and quickly passed it to Meat, saying, here you go, Meat. Keep that for a spare. No thanks, Meat said, handing it back to Tommy. Pee-wee looked at those around him and blubbered. You bunch of turds. I'm going to get you guys. You too, Wendy. Oh, no, Wendy exclaimed, tossing her head back and covering her eyes with the back of her hand. How can I possibly endure? Behind her, Tommy blew up the condom like a balloon. Then he clasped his hand tightly around the open end to keep the air inside. Lowering the inflated projectile over his groin, he pawed at the ground with his feet, then charged Wendy and goosed her from behind. With a surprised shriek, Wendy bounded away from Tommy. He laughed and waddled toward her with the rubber swaying in front of him. Where do you come off rating this pecker only a B plus, huh? And a D for endurance? Hey, I'll show you some endurance. Like a stray bull in Pomplona, Tommy started chasing anything that moved and poking his balloon with wild abandon. The girls squealed as they tried to flee his advances, but he managed to nudge everyone in reach. Laughing merrily, he was so caught up with his game that he failed to notice the approach of Miss Ballbricker until he suddenly whirled about and butted the end of his plastic pud directly into her groin. 
Oh, he murmured through a lopsided smile when he realized what he'd done. Everyone around him watched silently as Miss Ballbricker looked up slowly from the perturbance pressing against her gym shorts. She eyed Tommy stonily, and he loosened his grip on the condom. Air leaked out, and the flesh-toned balloon slowly drooped between his legs. A thin smile spread like a ruptured fault line across Miss Ballbricker's Teutonic features, and in her cold eyes a faint spark flashed for a second as she held one hand out to Tommy, palm facing upward. Tommy handed her the deflated condom and waited for the denunciation he was sure would follow. To his surprise, however, Ms. Ballbricker merely slung the limp rubber over her shoulder as if it were a pelt she'd just bought at the trading post, then marched off. The other students stepped aside and made room for her advance. Wendy came over to Tommy after Ms. Ballbricker had gone inside. I'm sorry, Tommy. It wasn't your fault, Tommy said. Your ass is grass, Turner, Mickey told him. Tell me about it. Tommy mumbled dismally. The day was suddenly not so wonderful. Chapter 8 Ill Winds Waved from the Rafters After the upcoming contest with Green Acres City, there would be only one more game in the football season before the school's focus shifted to the Angel Beach High basketball team defending city champions. The varsity hoopsters took to the locker room following classes Wednesday to begin their first practice of the year. Billy was the first one to suit up, and while he was admiring himself in the mirror and tucking in his warm-up jersey, he noticed Tommy licking his finger to wipe a smudge off his new sneakers. Hey, hey, Billy said, loud enough for everyone to hear. Like those shoes, Tommy, Definitely A+. Plus. Can it, Tommy said. That joke died of old age before second period. You want to give me a hard time? Come up with some fresher material, okay? Like your jock strap, for instance? Pee-wee strolled into the locker room, whistling. Here comes the terror of the backcourt, Tommy announced. Make way for the king. Thank you, thank you, Pee-wee said, gingerly twirling the dial on his combination lock. You know what they say about me once I take the floor. He'll never bore us. That's Pee Wee Morris. Is that what they say? Tommy snickered. I thought it was, this guy's too short to play this sport. Uh-uh, Pee Wee said, shaking his head as he threw open his locker. That's what you hear from those who don't know any better. The enlightened masses know I'm hot. For once, Pee Wee wasn't idly bragging. Last year, he led all Angel Beach players in scoring, and he was in the local record books as the shortest player ever to make the All-City starting team. Like Napoleon, he'd found an outlet where he could rise to heights beyond his stature. A few other players came in and started changing into their practice uniforms, and Brian Schwartz was among them. Brian went over to his locker, which was away from the others, and quietly began to undress. On his way out to the gym, Tommy stopped near Brian and said, I guess you're glad now that we didn't dupe you into going with us on the Cherry Forever fiasco, right? Brian nodded solemnly. Yeah, he said softly, rubbing the imprint of a tennis shoe sole off his locker. It was nothing personal, you understand. Right, Brian said. I understand. Perfectly. Tommy wandered over to the wall and plucked up a basketball, then sighed and came back over. Say, listen, Brian, uh, some of the guys are thinking of going to Porky's this weekend, if you're interested. Brian shook his head. I don't think so. The door to the locker room opened, and Tim strode in, carrying his gym bag. Tommy slipped out the door before it closed and left Tim and Brian facing one another. They say you're trying out for forward, Tim said coldly. Brian nodded as he adjusted the waistband on his shorts. Good. Tim bared a smile not unlike his father's. That's my position. Maybe we'll get a chance to play a little one-on-one. -on -one. 
Maybe, Brian said. Then he moved past him and headed out to the gym. The other boys in the locker room fell silent as Tim went over to his locker and started fumbling with the lock. Hey, Tim, Tommy finally broke the silence. About the other night, that little thing with your old man. What about it? Tim shouted, jerking his head to face Tommy. You want to make something of it? No, I just thought that I don't give a flying fuck what you think. I don't want to talk about it all right. Tommy put his hands up as if he was under arrest and backed away from Tim. Sure thing, Tim. You got it. Tim looked around at the others. Anybody else got the urge to stick their nose in my business? Nobody met his threatening gaze. One by one, they finished suiting up and left the locker room until only Tim and Pee Wee remained. Pee Wee kept a wary eye on Tim, then braved a short laugh. Just think, Tim. A couple of days and we'll be up to our ears in Nookie. Once we get up in Porky's playpen, we can double dribble all we want, right? Tim looked up sourly at Pee Wee, then shook his head and laughed. Pee Wee, you got a one track mind. Ain't it the truth, Pee Wee admitted. Well, I gotta get out there and take a few shots. Miss Honeywell's still out. She'll see old Pee Wee putting them through the hoops, and she'll be hot for me. Hot. Come on. Pee Wee was right. Miss Honeywell was still out on the floor wrapping up today's practice with the cheerleaders. Coaches Warren and Roy Brackett were observing her closely from the other side of the court, where the boys were shooting layups. How you doing with her? Warren asked Roy. Any luck? Roy shook his head. I cornered her for lunch yesterday and asked her out last night. Twenty bucks I dropped on dinner, and what do I get? Zero, man. Zilch. The girl wants to be loved for her mind. Coach Warren blew his whistle to get the boys' attention and shouted, Okay, guys, warm up with a few laps until Coach Goodenough gets out here. When the boys abandoned the court and started running up the steps, Warren looked back over at Roy and let out another of his quiet little howls. Man, you're driving me nuts with this howling bit, Roy whispered as he watched Miss Honeywell demonstrate the splits for the cheerleaders. She caught him looking at her and winked. Roy elbowed Warren. Did you see that? Did you see that? Come on, clue me in. What does that howling mean? Warren gestured up to where the boys were running their laps. The equipment rooms, Roy. I'm telling you, get her up there and all things shall be made clear. You're pulling my chain, man, Roy complained. That girl's a virgin. Yeah, and the Pope's Jewish. And how am I supposed to get her upstairs? Put handcuffs on her? Tie a rope around her neck? Coach Warren grinned. Try guile, charm, persuasion. If that doesn't work, then just ask her. Just then, Coach Goodenough came into the gym, walking alongside Miss Ballbricker. The two of them were wrapping up a conversation, and when they finished, Goodenough looked around until he spotted Tommy, then shouted, Turner, I want to talk to you. Oh, oh, Tommy muttered, halfway up the steps. He reversed his course, and as he started back down, he passed Billy. Methinks the boom is about to be lowered, Billy said. Good luck, Tommy, Pee Wee said between breaths. Whatever happens, it was worth it, right? We'll see, Tommy mumbled. The others continued running laps up and down the steps and around the upper bleachers in front of the equipment rooms. Most of them jogged at a leisurely pace without paying much attention to each other. Tim, however, spotted Brian a few yards ahead of him and picked up his speed until they were side by side. How you on running, Schwartz Bergenstein? Tim sneered. The name Schwartz, Brian said between breaths, unperturbed, just Schwartz. They reached the steps and Brian went up them two at a time, trying to get away from Tim. Tim stayed in step with him, though. You didn't answer my question. I asked how you were on running. I manage all right, Brian said as they cleared the last step and wound their way around the corner. As they started down the straightway in front of the upper bleachers, Tim spat, let's see, Jew boy, and broke into full stride, leaving Brian behind. Gritting his teeth, Tim pushed himself as hard as he could and passed Pee Wee and Billy. As he approached the end of the bleachers, he sent someone coming up on his left side. Brian was rapidly closing the distance between them. 
Soon they were side by side again, rounding the turn that led back to the steps. Bracing himself, Tim veered into Brian's path. Brian had seen the move coming, though, and he effortlessly diverted his own course by cutting behind Tim and passing him on the other side. Before Tim realized what had happened, Brian was bounding down the steps in front of him. Tim was enraged, but he slowed down his pace. Pee-wee and Billy caught up with him. Billy cleared his throat and told Tim, And you thought Jews were just smart and rich. Hey, fuck off, Tim swore, and he dropped behind them so that he could run by himself. Running down the straightaway on the gym floor, Tommy fell in beside Pee-wee and Billy. What happened with Coach Goodenough? Billy asked. Tommy held up two fingers without breaking stride. To what? Pee-wee said. Two days detention? Tommy shook his head. Two games and 2,000 laps. You're kidding, Billy said as they started back up the steps. Nope. Ms. Ballbricker's revenge, Pee-wee said. Afraid so, Tommy said glumly. They ran a while longer. Then Pee-wee looked over at Tommy and said, Just think, a couple of days and we're all going to be up to our necks and nookie. Chapter 9. Porky's Hospitality Suite. Way down south in the land of Porky's, we'll get a chance to use our dorkies. Fuck away, fuck away, fuck away, Porky's grand. We wish we were at Porky's. Away, away, at Porky's man. We'll raise our glands to live or die at Porky's. The boys were hoarse from singing as they rode through the Everglades, past the shack of Cherry Forever, and across the county line toward the faraway land of the Neon Pigs. The football team had demolished Green Acre City, 48 to 6, and everyone was in the mood for a proper celebration, a celebration that wasn't going to be taking place at the sock hop where their parents thought they were. Mickey was driving again. Tommy, Tim, Meat, and Pee-wee were crowding the cab beside him, drumming on the dashboard and howling out into the night with pornographic renditions of any song they all knew and could join in on. There were no other cars on the road, and Mickey swerved from one lane to another, rocking the gang back and forth. Shame about Billy not being able to come, Tommy said between songs. Yeah, Pee-wee said, as he bent over to reach beneath the seat for something. Boy, I'm sure glad my folks aren't chaperoning at the dance. Amen, Tommy said. Hey, Pee-wee, what are you doing? Tim said. He caught an elbow in the face as Pee-wee tried to put on his varsity letter sweater. I don't believe this guy, Meat said, giving Pee-wee a slight shove. You're out of your mind. Broads go for jocks, Pee-wee said. He leaned for a view of himself in the rear-view mirror so he could pat his hair back into place. High school jocks don't even get inside this place, you little moron, Tommy said. You're supposed to be 21. Nobody said I was still a high school jock, Pee-wee defended himself. How they gonna know, huh? No wonder you make out so good, Meat chortled, mussing Pee-wee's hair again. You're so sophisticated. Go ahead and laugh. Pee-wee grumbled as he took the sweater off. But if I get stuck with the dog, you guys got to give me some of my money back. What if you get stuck with Porky's pig? Tim asked him. Then I'll be making bacon, Pee-wee joked back. But hey, don't worry. We're going to all get fixed up with prime stuff. Right, Mickey? Great A, no doubt about it, Mickey assured him. He screeched the truck around a sharp turn, then quickly slowed down as they went past a large cinder block building set just off the road. An Everglade canal ran behind it, and two patrol cars were parked in front. The lettering across the front of the building read, Sheriff's Department, Wallace Town, Florida. Get a load of that, Meat said when he spotted a few uniformed officers sitting around a card table in the room just behind the huge bay doors of the garage. Where the hell is Wallace Town? Pee-wee asked. You're looking at it, Mickey said. Those are Porky Stormtroopers. Porky Wallace is his full name. Get it? Better mind your manners with the ladies, Tommy warned Pee-wee. 
you don't screw them the right way, these guys will use you for catfish bait. Hey, come on, Pee Wee said warily, looking back as they drove past the station. Hey, Pee Wee, you're such an expert, you got nothing to worry about, Tim said. Yeah, Meat put in. You brought your honey, didn't you? You guys can't scare me, Pee Wee said. A hundred yards further down the road, another neon sign pointed out a dirt turnoff, and Mickey took it, calling out, Abandon all hope, all ye who enter here. The dirt road led through a thicket of mangroves, then opened out to a clearing. Porkies, Pee Wee shouted excitedly, leaning forward to peer out the windshield for his first close-up glimpse of the establishment. The huge place rested on thick posts rising up from the dark waters of the canal. A wooden walkway surrounded the building and stretched across the moat-like streams that fingered out from the main waterway. There were two other bridges connecting a dirt parking lot with the mainland. Mickey drove over one of the bridges and parked. More than two dozen other vehicles, mostly pickups or run-down station wagons, were already there, and a few dark figures could be seen staggering drunkenly across the bridges. Loud music spilled out of the main building, competing with the swell of night sounds in the surrounding swamps. All right, Tommy shouted as they clambered out of the truck. So far, so good. Hey, me, you got any strength left after the game? Tim asked him. Maybe you've done your share of tackling for one night. No way, Meat said, hitching up his pants. I'm ready. Let's do it then, Mickey said. Everybody got their IDs? The boys went for their wallets and produced their highly prized fake driver's licenses and birth certificates. Peavy's face suddenly went white. He slapped his pockets with desperate futility. Oh, shit, oh, shit, I left mine at home. Figures, Tim growled. That's okay, Pee-wee, Tommy said, rolling his eyes. I'm sure you won't have any problems getting in. Yeah, just stand up straight, Meat choked. Don't talk and we'll say you're an albino pygmy. Okay, guys, knock it off, Mickey said, as he blocked their way across the bridge. We go in there yucking it up like a bunch of kids, and they're going to throw us out in our ears. Tommy stiffened and lowered his voice, saying, Yes, I think you made a good point there, Michael. He turned to the others. Gentlemen, may I remind you that this is an adult establishment. It behooves you to act accordingly. Meat flexed his foot as if he were preparing to kick a field goal. Bend over, Turner, and I'll behoove you right up to the front of the stage. Mickey threw his arms up with exasperation. Okay, fine. You guys can stay here and keep rehearsing. If I run into Ted Mack inside, I'll send him out and you can all audition while I'm plowing my way through Cuban Nookie. Mickey's right, Tim said. Let's get it together. The others laid off the wisecracks for the time being and looked to Mickey to lead the way. That's more like it, he said. Now meet, give Pee Wee your ID. But it's got my picture on it. Mickey looked Meat and Pee-wee over. No sweat. You guys could be twins. We'll just say Pee-wee's been sick. What other cards you got, Meat? Meat gave Pee-wee his driver's license and went back to his wallet. Tommy looked over Meat's shoulder, then reached into his wallet, grabbed something, and handed it to Meat, saying, Here, use this. That's my Bible school card, Meat exclaimed. Praise the Lord, Tommy said. What could be better? think a guy from Bible school would lie about his age, right? Good enough, Mickey said as he started across the bridge. The others followed. Now just act cool. Make it look like you come here all the time. Think you can handle that, Pee-wee? Hey, I'm a pro when it comes to these things, Pee-wee boasted. The music swelled louder as they approached the door, and Mickey bobbed his head in time with the bass line. Pee-wee followed suit and snapped his fingers, staring up as they passed under the main sign. The female cartoon pig raised her skirt and winked, and Pee-wee was ready to start thinking about garbage. As Mickey was about to open the door, it suddenly burst outward, and he jumped to one side as a drunkard in Stetson hat stumbled by. 
Groping for something to grab hold of, the drunk finally found the walkway railing leaned over and retched beer and half-digested burgers into the marsh waters below. When the man was finished, he wiped his face, grinned merrily at the boys, then staggered back inside. I wouldn't recommend the food here, Mickey said. No oh, shit, Meat murmured. I wouldn't count on it, Tommy said. Inside, there was a partitioned-off entranceway where a bouncer neat size sat on a stool checking IDs. An axe handle was propped against the wall nearby, within plain sight and easy reach. He glowered at the boys and bellowed, Okay, let's see him. Pee-wee took a deep breath as the others went before him and flashed their cards. The bouncer nodded his head blankly and waved them by one by one, and didn't bother to inspect any IDs closely until Pee-wee came by. He grabbed Pee-wee by the wrist and pulled his hand toward him for a better look at the driver's license with Meat's face on it. Squinting through the curl of smoke trailing up from his cigarette, the bouncer compared the picture with Pee-wee's ashen countenance. Then he glanced over at Meat and snorted contemptuously through his nose, blowing hot ash on Pee-wee's hand before letting it go. Go ahead, Ace, the bouncer told him. Have a ball. Once his pulse had settled down to the point where he could speak, Pee-wee pocketed Meat's ID and grinned cockily. Yeah, it's been a couple years since I've been in the old joint here, he said. The bouncer shook his head laughing. Yeah, a fucking regular, ain't you? Just stop talking and start drinking. Plan to, plan to. Pee-wee droned on, puffing out his chest. How's Porky anyway? Hell, I haven't seen old Porky in... Meat dragged Pee-wee away from the bouncer and escorted him to the main room. You trying to talk your way out of here, you little twerp? He chuckled. Hey, easy on the merchandise, Pee-wee said, taking Meat's hands off him and looking around. His jaw hung slack and he moaned, Holy shit! Corky seemed even larger from the inside than it had from the parking lot, and still it was crowded. Underneath the thick beams and angled rafters, the bar stretched out over several levels that were filled with tables where men sat swilling beer after beer and howling over the blare of music being played by a five-piece band tucked away in one of the far corners. None of them looked under 200 pounds, and they all seemed to be missing more than a few teeth. There were also a handful of pigs waddling between people's legs and squealing their way across the loose straw layering the floorboards. The pigs were interested in lapping up pools of spilled beer or scraps of food that had found their way to the floor, but most of the men had their attention on the center stage. There, under the glare of spotlights, a dwarf in a cowboy suit was holding the reins on a string of five dancing girls who made Cherry forever look overdressed. Wearing nothing but spiked heels, a g-string, and pasties, they danced in a line around the stage, laughing at the obscene taunts directed their way by men crowding the railing for a closer look. Holy shit, Pee-wee howled, blinking his eyes with disbelief. It's a pussy stampede. Nookie on parade. I must have died and gone straight to hell. Hot damn. Just remember, Meat said, leading Pee-wee to a pair of bar stools near the stage. Don't drool and don't touch. Right, Pee-wee said as he jumped up onto one of the stools, leaned forward and waved to get the attention of the dancers. Give me something hot, he called out. Let's have a look at some nookie. Easy, Pee-wee, easy, Meat said, glancing over at where the other boys had made their way to the bar. Up on stage, one of the dancers spotted Pee-wee and worked her way over to him. She rolled her shoulders so that her breasts bobbed up and down and threatened to send the pasties flying. Come on, let's see ya, Pee-wee shouted. The stage was elevated so that the dancer towered over Pee-wee and Meat. Smiling coyly, she bent over, moving closer and closer to them. She put one hand out and flashed two fingers. Yeah, hell yes, let's see them both, 
Pee-wee said. Meat smirked, nudging his friend. She means it'll cost you two bucks to see them, stupid. Pee-wee's face reddened with embarrassment, but he quickly recovered. Going for his wallet and pulling up two bills, he said nonchalantly, Shit, I knew that. I'm just having some fun with the broad. Pee-wee laid two dollars on the stage in front of him, and the dancer gathered them up between her toes and the soles of her shoes. Then she cupped her hands over her breasts and pulled the pasties away long enough for Pee-wee to catch a faint glimpse of her nipples. Standing up, she covered herself again and danced over to another part of the stage. She's hot, Pee-wee said, grabbing at Meat's shirt sleeve. The broad is hot. God, I can't stand it. Better start pacing yourself, Pee-wee. We just got here. Across the way, Tim, Tommy, and Mickey were standing at the bar, watching the action while they waited for the burly bartender to come by with their drinks. He set three eight-ounce glasses in front of the boys, then grumbled, A buck. I got it, Tommy said, producing a dollar and setting it on the bar. A buck apiece, the bartender said. Tommy looked at Mickey. Mickey nodded and pitched in another dollar. Tim paid the balance. After the bartender had left, Tommy looked at his beer and said, Must be imported or something, huh? Imported from some rednecks backyard brewery, no doubt, Mickey said. Come on, this is the big leagues, guys. Tommy held his drink up and inspected it closely. For a buck, you'd think they'd put a prize in it or something. Don't worry, they did, Mickey said knowingly. We just don't collect it till we get some ladies up in Porky's pen, that's all. I hope so, Tim said, taking a slow sip. When they looked back out at the stage, they saw trouble. One of the rednecks next to Meat and Pee-wee stood up on his stool, leaned out over the railing, and grabbed one of the dancers by the waist, clinging to her like a drowning man. The other women retreated while the man's friends cheered him on. Two of the bouncers charged forward from different sections of the bar, bowling over a few patrons, not quick enough to get out of their way. They both reached the man on the railing at the same time and jerked him away from the dancer. Pee-wee was caught up in the middle of the fracas, and when the bouncer started laying into their victim with brass-knuckled fists, Pee-wee slumped to the floor to keep from being pummeled by errant swings. He curled up in a ball until the bouncers managed to drag the now unconscious redneck away from the bar and toward the exit. Then Meat leaned over to help him to his feet, just as the other boys came over. What the hell was that? Tim asked. Meat explained. Guy tried to muff dive the dancer. Jesus, they practically killed the poor shit, Tommy said. Hey, what about you, Pee-wee? You okay? Pee-wee managed a fragile smile as he brushed himself off. Sure, man, I'm fine. That choker had a good aim, though. Got his nose right up there. Well, don't get any ideas, Pee-wee, Meat advised. Don't worry, Pee-wee said. I'll wait till we get him in the pen. Then I'll just stay put, and they'll plant Nookie on my nose like they were playing horseshoes. They'll have an easier time finding your nose than your pecker, that's for sure, Meat said. The band finished the last song of their set and put aside their instruments while the dancers put on flimsy kimonos or shifts and came down from the stage to mingle with the patrons. Mickey put an arm around Pee-wee's shoulder and gestured to the women as if they worked for him. This is your night, Pee-wee. Pick the one you want. One, Pee-wee said, licking his lips. Only one? You're drooling, Meat told him. I warned you about that. Pee-wee looked the women over. The one he paid two dollars met his gaze and puckered her lips at him. Her, Pee-wee announced. Fine, Mickey said coolly. I'll take care of it for you. As Mickey went back to the bar, Tommy watched him and smirked. Jarvis is one cool operator, eh? Acts like he owns the joint. Like he says, that's what it takes, Tim said. Reaching the bar, Mickey waved his hand to get the bartender's attention. Looking up from where he was wiping off the countertop, the bartender said, Yeah, what you want? Ready for another beer already? 
Mickey shook his head. I'd like to speak to Porky, he said with calm authority. Porky's busy. He's not too busy for what I want to talk about, Mickey said with a confident grin. I want to pay for some pussy. The bartender flashed a quick look at one of the men leaning up against the bar, raising an eyebrow, then stared at Mickey with a bored expression on his face. Why don't you talk to me about it? I want to talk to Porky, Mickey insisted. The bartender looked back over at the other man, and the corners of his mouth turned slightly upward. Okay, he told Mickey, let me see what I can do. As the bartender left his post and waded through the crowd to the back of the room, Mickey turned back to face his young cronies. See, he told them, you just gotta show them who's boss. Just let me handle everything while you hang out. And don't bother buying any drinks. Their racket is to get you to cough up to buy the broads overpriced beers. Tell me about it, Tommy said. No kidding, Pee Wee added sarcastically. Hell, we can just get off the boat, you know. The bartender made his way back through the throng, pausing at a few tables to whisper to the men, who in turn chuckled to one another and glanced over at the boys. The girls were watching them too now, and the noise level in the bar seemed to be dwindling by the second. What gives? Tommy wondered aloud. The bartender returned and nodded to Mickey as he went back behind the bar. Porky's on his way out. All right, Mickey said. We're in business. The boys looked back the way the bartender had come. Three steps led up to a raised landing that was blocked from view by a wall covered with dents, beer stains, and dried blood from countless brawls. As the growing quiet spread through the bar, the boys could hear footsteps creaking the floorboards behind the wall, and then a man came into view, standing at the edge of the landing and glaring at them. He was an awesome figure, standing well over six feet and weighing close to 400 pounds, much of it centered around a torso that strained at the seams of a fringed leather vest he wore over a flannel shirt. A ten-gallon hat was perched upon his thick head, and he had a ruddy, bulging face that left little doubt as to his identity. A large cigar protruded from his mouth, giving off rank puffs of smoke whenever he breathed. Who wants to see me? Porky asked in a harsh voice. Pee-wee and the others looked to Mickey, who took a slow step forward, bolstering his courage with a deep breath before saying, We do. What do you want? Porky started down the steps, which sagged and groaned under his great weight. Well, Porky, Mickey said with more control, my friends and I would like to party with five of your girls and Porky's pen. Porky grinned. He hadn't lost any of his teeth. So, you want five of my piglets in the pen, eh? That's right, Mickey said. One of my friends has already picked out one of the dancers, but we'd like to have a few of those Cuban honeys, too, if they aren't already spoken for. How long you want them? An hour. How much you got to spend? A hundred bucks, Mickey said proudly. A hundred bucks for five girls. Porky mused, looking around at the other men in the bar. They were already starting to howl. Porky shook his head and told Mickey, Go home, snot nose. As Porky turned around and started back up the steps, Mickey blurted out, Wait, Porky, please? What now? Thinking fast, Mickey asked, Well, how many girls can we have for a hundred dollars? Porky paused on the middle step, stroking his chin as he eyed the boys. He seemed to be mulling things over. There's five of you, right? He countered. That's a lot of horny dicks. Figure two girls for an hour, three for thirty minutes. That's all, Mickey said, crestfallen. Behind him, the others began to grumble. No one's forcing you, Porky said. Grinning, he added, but it's a long ride home, even longer with a heart on. Mickey looked behind him at the other guys. Meat raised three fingers, and the others nodded in agreement. We'll take three for thirty minutes, Mickey told Porky. Porky stuck his thumbs in the pocket of his vest. My Cuban honeys are all tied up tonight, so to speak, he drawled. Take your pick from what's out here. 
Mickey pointed out Pee Wee's choice and two other dancers. Those three. Cash in advance, Porky said. Mickey turned to confer with the others. I don't know, Tommy said. Porky boomed. Only way I do business, boys. You can take it or leave it. Makes no difference to me. Okay, Mickey said, taking out the hundred dollars the boys had pooled earlier in the evening. He took a step toward Porky, but the owner flagged him to a halt by raising his hand. Not me. Pay the bartender, you ridiculous fucking dude. Porky took a step down to the main floor and pointed a warning finger at the boys. And if any of you half pints get out of line with my girls, I'll kick your candy asses all the way back to Angel Beach. The boys looked down at their feet and tried to ignore the smattering of whoops and catcalls sounding from around the room. Pee-wee was only half listening to Porky because he was relegating the rest of his concentration to making sure he didn't pee in his pants. This wasn't the way it was supposed to work, he thought. It was supposed to be like going to a restaurant where everybody was all smiles and eager to please. After Mickey handed the money over to the bartender, Porky pointed to the wall behind the boys and growled. See that door over there? Well, step right on through it and wait. It will be dark in there, but don't be surprised. Huh? Tommy said. Mickey overcame his uncertainty and stared angrily at Porky. Hey, what's this bullshit? Porky took a step forward as his small, dark eyes bored into Mickey's. This bullshit is because you're a pack of underage kids, and I ain't looking to have my liquor license revoked. Sheriff around here is a badass mother, and I don't want to have to mess with him. Two of the dancers let out brief shrieks, then clasped their hands across their mouths when Porky shot them an angry glance. Once they were quiet, he went on. Now if you want to party with my girls, you'll do it where no one can see you, which is through that door. It's the back way to my pen. You just go out and wait till you hear a knock. Then go through another door, and you're in. The girls will meet you back there, and you'll have yourselves the best damn half hour you ever spent. Yeah, Pee-wee exclaimed, drowning out the uncertain murmurs of the others. You like that, kid? Porky asked Pee-wee. Good. I'll give you a night to remember. All right, Pee-wee said, adding under his breath. That's more like it. I don't know, Tommy said again. It's all under control now, Mickey said, as he headed for the door. Come on. As the others fell in behind him, they looked around the bar one last time. Everybody was watching them. Mickey held the door open, and Pee-wee was the first one through. Once they were all out, the bartender closed the door on them, and they found themselves in total darkness. I think next time we should just go to a whorehouse like normal people do, Tommy said probing the walls around him. Did you see those broads? Pee-wee asked. Those broads are hot, guys. They're really hot. They're paid to be hot, Casanova, Neat said. I don't like this, Tim muttered. It's no sweat, Tim, Mickey whispered in the darkness. Everything's under control, I'm telling you. Pee-wee started sniffing loudly as he inched along the wooden planks beneath them. Hey, I can smell pussy, right close. Must be on the other side of the door. I can't feel any door, Tommy said. Smells to me like dead catfish, Neat complained. You got problems, Pee-wee. That's just because you're so tall, Meat, Pee-wee said. Down here at Nookie level, the smell is definitely pussy. Back in the bar, Porky moved close to the main door and called out to the boys. Okay, you guys about ready? Ready, Mickey called out. Ready and raring, Pee-wee added. Let's get the show on the road, Neat called out. Okay, boys, Porky told him. Here's your night to remember. The boys took a tentative step through the darkness toward the other door, and the walkway suddenly dropped out beneath them. Before they could voice their shock, the five of them tumbled, one on top of another, down into the turgid waters of the channel. It was cold and mucky, and once they surfaced, they gasped for air, thrashed their arms, and began to swear blue streaks as they struggled to their feet. Hey, I'm drowning, Pee-wee wailed. Just stand up, asshole, Meat shouted bitterly. It's only two feet deep. Covered with muck and slime, they straggled up the embankment beneath the pier. 
Tim came up behind Mickey and shoved him into Meat, saying, Great work, Mickey. Meat pushed Mickey back the other way and spit out a mouthful of brackish water. Everything's under control, right, Mickey? Fucking big shot. Mickey hurried away from the others, cleared the incline, and stood at the edge of the parking lot. As he scraped mud from his skin and clothes, he tried to keep his own rage at bay. You promised to get me laid, Pee Wee whimpered at Mickey, banging his head to get water out of his ear. Tommy scooped up a handful of mud and tossed it at Mickey, missing him by inches. Mickey, you're a horseshit, lousy procurer. I'll take care of this, Mickey said with icy calm as he eyed the entrance to Porky's. The laughter inside was loud enough for all of them to hear. You've done enough already, Tim said cynically. I'm for quitting while we're ahead, Tommy said. Meat grumbled. What's left to take care of, Mickey? We're already out 20 bucks a piece. I said I'll take care of it, Mickey shouted back. No, wait, Mickey, Pee Wee called out, but it was too late. Mickey was already across the bridge and charging back into the bar. Mickey rushed past the bouncer, stopped just inside the main room, and raked the interior with a baleful gaze, seeking out the owner. Not finding him, he shouted, I want to see Porky, and I want to see him now. Get that piece of pig shit out here. The bar patrons gaped at Mickey with disbelief. One of the bouncers strode up the three steps to the upper level, calling out Porky's name, while his partner at the front entrance snatched up his axe handle and quickly closed the door to the bar before the other boys from Angel Beach could re-enter. Then he ambled lazily through the archway into the main room, blocking Mickey's chance for escape and grinning sadistically as he tested the weight of the weapon in his hand. Porky waded back out into view and beamed with mirth at the sight of Mickey, who was shaking muck from his hair, darting his eyes around the room like a cornered animal deliberating his next move. How was the pussy, boy? I want a piece of your fat ass, Mickey told Porky with menacing calm. Porky flinched momentarily at the insult, then matched Mickey's cool exterior. Sure, son, he said slowly. Let's just step outside. We don't want to ruin these nice folks' evening any more than we have already, do we? Porky nodded to the bouncer with the axe handle, who stepped to one side and let Mickey pass him. Mickey! Pee-wee cried out, rushing forward with the others to grab their friend and pull him away from the bar. Hell, we could hear you from out here. You trying to get us all killed or something? Mickey struggled to break free, but Meat and Tim had a firm grip on him. Let me go. I'll whip that tub's fat ass. Sure you will, Meat said. You and what army? They'd gotten as far as the parking lot when the door to the bar opened again. Porky stepped out, flanked by his three bouncers. They had well over half a ton of redneck hell between them, and as they walked toward the boys, Pee-wee forgot about garbage and manure and started trying to remember some prayers. The hulking foursome paused halfway across the bridge and looked up at the boys. Meat and Tim tightened their grip on Mickey. So what's it going to be, Porky said. Mickey started to say something, but Tommy covered his mouth and called out, Sorry about our friend, Mr. Porky. He gets carried away sometimes. Yeah, Meat said. We'll just take him home and forget about the whole thing. We won't be bothering you again, Tommy said. Honest. Mickey had other ideas, though. He pretended to go along with his friends as they started for his pickup. Then, when Meat and Tim eased their grips on him, he jerked free and bolted toward the bridge. Mickey, damn you, Meat shouted as he and the others chased after him. Porky signaled his men to stay put as he took a step forward to meet Mickey's advance. Mickey rushed up to him and took a roundhouse swing that caught Porky in the stomach. Porky merely watched the fist connect, showing no sign that it had affected him. Then he calmly stuck one arm out and shoved Mickey with such force that the youth stumbled into the railing and broke it loose. Unable to regain his balance, Mickey fell backward into the shallow water. On the bridge, Porky's bouncers howled with delight and slapped their boss on the back. Mickey's friends came to his aid, climbing back down the slope and pulling him from the water. 
He wasn't seriously injured, and all four of the others secured grips on him to make sure he couldn't break free again. Before they could get him to the pickup, the two Wallace Town patrol cars bounded across one of the main bridges and screeched to a halt in the middle of the parking lot. Before the dust settled, four uniformed officers, equal in size to Porky's small army, stood between the boys and Mickey's truck. The largest of the officers was also the sheriff, and he broke the sudden silence with a harsh command. All right, nobody move. Nobody moved. The sheriff looked over at Porky and asked, What's going on here, Pork? Porky looked with contempt at the high schoolers. These Angel Beach boys came here looking for some trouble. That's a lie, Tim snapped. Yeah, Pee Wee chirped in, grateful that his prayers had apparently been answered. We were just here looking. Shut the fuck up, the sheriff commanded, taking a threatening step toward Pee Wee. He had his nightstick out, and he started patting it against the opened palm of his free hand as he circled around the boys, inspecting them like cattle on auction day. Looks to me like we got some Angel Beach assholes here. Yes, sir, five walkin', talkin' rectums. The Wallace Town deputies joined Porky's men in a short flurry of muffled laughter, while the sheriff sized up Mickey and gestured for the others to let him go. Looks to me like you're the star of the show tonight, boy. My name's Jarvis, Mickey Jarvis. Hmm, the sheriff said, scratching the back of his head. Seems to me I know some Jarvis folk, live down the road a ways. I got family all across the state, Mickey said, rednecks and proud of it. Oh, is that a fact, the sheriff said dryly. That's supposed to make me want to kiss your ass or something, boy? You think that, you got the wrong idea. To me, you're just another panty waist from the big city who thinks he can come out here when he damn well pleases and dab his dipstick in our women. You got that? I'm making myself nice and clear to you. I understand, Pee-wee said. We get the message. Shut your face, short stuff. I wasn't talking to you. The sheriff noticed Tommy and me looking at Mickey's pickup, only a few precious yards away. He pointed at it with his nightstick. This what you young pups came here in? None of the boys answered. They didn't have to. The sheriff looked the pickup over, then glanced back at Mickey. Nice redneck pickup. Must be yours, eh? Mickey had run out of sass. He nodded. I see, the sheriff rambled on. Now, I don't know the laws in Seward County, but here we got laws about driving with busted headlights. Mickey frowned. I don't have a busted headlight. Porky sniggered, and his henchmen joined the deputies in another fit of laughter as the sheriff took aim at the right headlight on Mickey's truck, then smashed it in with a blow of his nightstick. Mickey cringed as if he'd been struck by the same blow. Inspecting the damage, the sheriff clucked his tongue and shook his head. I'm afraid that's a $30 fine, boy. 30 bucks or a night in jail. Defeated, Mickey fished through his pockets and came up with a handful of bills. I've only got nine bucks, he said mournfully, staring at the nightstick in the sheriff's hand. I've got 15, Tommy said, going for his wallet. I've got six to make 30, Meat said. Hot damn, Porky taunted from behind. Sounds like they teach you Angel Beach boys how to count real good. While the locals turned up their laughter another notch, the sheriff circled around to the back of Mickey's truck, then suddenly lashed out and shattered the right rear taillight. Oh, oh, take a look back here, he said, poking at the damage with the tip of his nightstick. Busted taillight runs you 20 more. I've got three more, Meat said as he struggled to keep his temper from flaring. I've only got a buck fifty, Tim moaned. I got five, Pee-wee said, as he reached into a hidden fold in his wallet. He realized it wasn't going to be buying him a blowjob tonight, after all. The sheriff came over to the boys and collected the money from Tommy, stuffed into his shirt pocket, and said, Well, this is close enough. I figure I can show leniency for first offenders. He looked over at Porky. What you think, Pork? Shall I give these nice lads a break? Porky waved and turned to head back to his bar. Yeah, give them a break. They're nice, clean-cut Angel Beach pussies. You heard the man, the sheriff told the boys as he stepped aside and pointed his stick at the pickup. Now get your candy asses back to Seward County and keep them there. This here's a man's county. 
Chapter 10. Lessons Go Unlearned. After a week in the shop, Pee-wee's blue Crosley was finally ready for him to pick up the next morning. All its nickel and dime ailments had been mended, and the car ran the best it had since Pee-wee inherited it from his grandfather on his 16th birthday. To celebrate, Pee-wee spent most of the day on the road. He cruised up to Fort Myers to run some errands for his father, then hung out a few hours at the beach to watch girls sunbathe and admire the sailboats gliding out across the Gulf of Mexico. His big dream in life was to make enough money to buy a six-footer and stock it with enough provisions to sail around the world. He traveled from port to port, going ashore to dabble with the ladies of all lands, so that when he returned, he'd be a true man of the world, a connoisseur of nookie and the envy of Angel Beach. Instead of Pee-wee, the guys would call him Cap'n. He'd wear navy blazers and spiffy caps with black brims and have some knockout for a first mate that would make Marilyn Monroe look like a has-been floozy. After indulging himself with an afternoon of these and other fantasies, Pee-wee raced the sunset back to Angel Beach and arrived at the industrial park on Bartlett Avenue. As the street lights blinked on for the night, the seniors were building their float in a warehouse owned by Wendy Williams' father, and Pee-wee swaggered in just as a dozen or so of his classmates were wrapping up the day's work. Hey, nice of you to drop by so early, Marvin Bro greeted Pee-wee sarcastically. Glad you could make it. Thanks, Pee-wee grinned back. Glad to come lend a hand. He looked around the warehouse, expecting to see some of the guys he'd gone to Porky's with the night before. None of them were there, though. He hadn't expected to see Nicky or Tim, since neither of them was much on school spirit. But he thought for sure Meat would be there, or at least Tommy. He asked around, but nobody had seen any of them all day. Great, Pee-wee thought to himself. He'd have to sit on the secret about last night's adventure now, since he wasn't sure how the others felt about making it news. The theme for next weekend's homecoming was, The Future is Ours and the senior's float consisted of an oversized Angel Beach football player riding a porpoise bucking bronco style. The lettering on the side of the float read, Seniors have found the ultimate porpoise in life. Tommy's idea. The chicken wire outline of the porpoise was almost completely stuffed with colored wads of tissue paper, while the player riding it was only completed from the waist down. Pee-wee was going to climb up and help start on the shirt, but as he circled around to the other side of the float, he decided he'd rather work on the lettering. His decision might have had something to do with the fact that Beth Ann Robarts was sitting by herself on the floor, filling in the S in seniors. How about some help, Beth Ann? Pee-wee asked politely as he dropped down beside her. Oh, hi, Pee-wee, she said with a smile. Sure, how about if you hand me the tissues and then I'll stick them in? Sure, sure, Pee-wee said. Beth Ann was wearing a blouse that buttoned up from the front, and Pee-wee quickly noticed that whenever she leaned forward to weave tissue through the chicken wire, the spaces between the buttons parted and provided him with brief glimpses of what was underneath the blouse. His heart began to beat with excitement. With any luck, he'd be able to get a look at her bra and find out how much of her ample bosom was courtesy of Mother Nature and how much was padding in line for a possible award for best performance in a supporting role. After the eyeful he'd been treated to at Porky's last night, this hardly seemed worth the effort or anxiety. But, then again, Beth Ann Robart's breasts weren't going to go on display for the mere price of two dollars placed on a stage floor. This was a new frontier he was on the verge of discovering. Ponce de Leon, watch out. Beth Ann was oblivious to Pee-wee's ulterior motive, and as she gradually turned her body away from him, filling gaps of chicken wire from left to right, each movement gave Pee-wee a better view of the secrets lurking between her buttons. It was driving him wild, and he had to concentrate to keep his hand from shaking as he passed tissue to her. Just as Beth Ann was about to make that one final turn that would have provided the revelation of revelations, Marvin showed up with a Coke and knelt down on the other side of Beth Ann. 
When she turned to reach for the Coke, Pee-wee's peep show was suddenly over. Hey, Pee-wee, where were you last night, huh? Marvin asked. Pee-wee looked at Marvin and tried to guess how much he already knew. Marvin had a cocky smile on his face, but Pee-wee finally figured he was bluffing. I didn't feel like dancing, Pee-wee answered evasively as he took a wad of tissue and crammed it into the framework of the float. Tommy didn't show up at the dance either, Marvin said, or Tim, or Mickey, or me, I mean Tony. As Marvin smiled apologetically at Beth Ann, Pee-wee rolled his eyes, then asked, well, how was it? The dance, Marvin said, a lot of fun, right, Beth Ann? Beth Ann sipped her Coke and nodded, then licked her lips innocently. It was great. Too bad you guys couldn't make it, Marvin droned on. But I guess you all had a good time, whatever you were doing. Us guys? Pee-wee asked. Who said I was out with the guys? Maybe I was home catching up on my science project. Right, Marvin laughed. And maybe Frank Sinatra dropped by the sock hop to croon a few songs. What are you trying to get at, Marvin? Pee-wee asked. Two could play his game, he thought. Playing traffic cop in the parking lot's not good enough for you now, high pockets. You gotta join the junior FBI, too? Marvin's neck turned red, and Pee-wee grinned with satisfaction. Beth Ann finished her coke and said, Excuse me, I have to talk to Phyllis a second. Once she'd walked out of hearing range, Marvin glared at Pee-wee with unrestrained hostility. You're lucky I didn't come right out and let her know what a little pervert you are, Morris. What? Pee-wee couldn't believe Marvin had caught him trying to peek through Beth Ann's blouse. Marvin lowered his voice and said, Listen, Pee-wee, I overheard Billy talking to Frank Bell at the dance. He said something about you and Tommy and the other guys going somewhere to get your horns clipped. Oh, yeah? What of it? Pee-wee said, realizing Marvin was in the dark on all counts. You having trouble getting pussy or something? Looking for some tips on how to get it? I wouldn't be talking to you if I did, Marvin said coolly. I was more interested in how hard up you guys were. Oh, listen to the big stud, Pee-wee sneered. Hey, high pockets, I bet the only reason Beth Ann's letting you take her to the homecoming dance is because there aren't any eunuchs in the senior class. You're the most harmless thing she could find. Marvin shook his head and chuckled. <laughs> Do I detect a wee bit of jealousy, eh? Got so many sour grapes she can't help but whine a little. Is that it, Pee-wee? Hey, you're a real bore, Marvin, Pee-wee said, standing up and brushing off his pants. Real Snoresville, you know what I mean? Who are you taking to homecoming anyway, Pee-wee? Marvin asked tauntingly. No, wait, let me guess. You're going to stay home and work on your science project instead. That the project where you see how quick you can grow hair on your palm? Pee-wee left Marvin laughing by the float and strode out of the warehouse, steaming with anger. He hated Marvin almost as much as he hated homecomings, sock hops, and proms. They were all reminders that for all his talking, he had about as much luck getting girls to go out with him as he did getting laid by them. Why am I such a loser, he wondered. How come everybody else seems to be banging away until their peckers are ready to fall off when the only action I can get is with my right hand? It's not fair, damn it. It's just not fair. Pee-wee got into his car and laid a patch of rubber as he screeched out onto Bartlett Avenue and sped down the block to the deadbeat diner. He was determined to drown his sorrows in a banana split with hot sauce. He spotted Mickey's pickup out back, though, and parked next to Tommy's Chevy. Just the sight of his friends hanging out at the nearest table was enough to shake him from his doldrums. He hopped out of the Crosley, shouting, Hey, guys, what's happening? Tommy said, you were just filling Billy in on the gory details about last night. Sounds like I missed a real hot time, Billy said between bites of a chili dog. Hey, where have you been all day, Pee-wee? Meat asked. We stopped by your place on the way over, and your dad was having a fit waiting for you to show up. Huh? Pee-wee said. I bought a bunch of junk for him up in Fort Myers. Hell, I told him I wouldn't be back till late tonight, though. What gives? Your mom had to drive out to check on your grandmother, Tommy explained. Your dad was hoping you'd be back in time so you could have gone with her. Grandma, Pee-wee said, suddenly worried. What happened to Grandma? Is she okay? Did she have a... She's okay, far as your dad could figure, Tommy assured him. Apparently, she had some kind of accident while she was cleaning out her attic. Fell down or some... The attic? Pee-wee gasped. Yeah, I guess she was moving things around or something. 
That's what your mom went to find out, besides just checking up to make sure your grandmother's okay. The attic, Petey repeated dismally. Yes, the attic, Tommy said. You know, it's a little room upstairs that usually gets filled up with junk. The attic, Pee-wee moaned. I'm finished. What are you talking about? Nothing. Pee-wee slumped onto the nearest bench and tuned out the others as me and Tommy took turns telling Billy about the rendezvous at Porky's the night before. He was imagining his grandmother up in the attic, stumbling across his archives of secret delights. Fell. She probably had a heart attack. His mother was going to go up into the attic and find Grandma stone-cold dead with her fingers wrapped around pages of tracing paper from Pee-wee's revised Sears robot catalog. What would happen after that? His folks would make him quit the basketball team. He'd be grounded for the next three years, then sent off to a seminary to become a priest. Or worse, Maybe they would declare him an incurable sex fiend and take him to some clinic somewhere, and the senior class would have a eunuch after all. Beth Ann Robarts would find out and ask him to be her escort to the Christmas prom. His world was crumbling around him. He'd never own his 60-foot yacht. He'd never travel around the world in 80 nookies. He was finished. It was a curse from God, punishment for going to Porky's. This was the reward he got for helping his grandmother. What the hell was she doing in her attic anyways? Oh, what a world. Hell, it's just something you have to write off, Tommy was explaining to Billy as Pee-wee's thoughts floated back down to earth and the moment at hand. They're bad mothers, I'll tell you that much. Mickey was sitting across from Pee-wee, holding a can of beer out of view under the table. His eyes were glassy. It obviously wasn't his first beer of the evening. As Pee-wee watched him, Mickey's jaw slowly tightened and his fingers simultaneously closed around his beer can and crushed it in his hand. Ah, oh, Mickey, Pee-wee murmured, setting aside his problems in favor of worrying about his friend. I'm going back, Mickey announced to no one in particular. What? Meat said, looking over. I'm going to get that beer gut pig fucker, Mickey's voice rose as he forced the words through his clenched teeth. Mickey, are you crazy? Billy said. When? Meat asked Mickey. Mickey jumped up from the table. Right now. He started for his truck. Meat took a step forward to intercept him, but Mickey charged quickly past him. Just then, Ted Jarvis pulled into the parking lot, bolted out of the patrol car, and grabbed his younger brother by the arm as Mickey was reaching for the door handle of the pickup. Ted turned Mickey around so that they were facing one another. You don't look too terrific, little brother, Ted said, genuinely concerned. I'm okay, Mickey mumbled, trying not to breathe in Ted's face. I understand you tried to butt heads with Porky last night, Ted said as he let go of Mickey. I'd have whipped his ass if it wasn't for the sheriff, Mickey boasted. Behind Mickey, Meat grumbled, that scumbag sheriff sided with Porky. And he busted Mickey's headlight, Tommy added. Tail light too, Pee Wee said. Just take a look. Ted glanced at the damage to his brother's truck, then looked at the ewes with mild annoyance. In case you hadn't guessed, that scumbag sheriff is Porky's brother. What? Tommy said. Some bitch, Meat swore and pounded his fist against the tabletop next to him. Ted looked back at his brother. So tell me, Mickey, where you think you're headed now? Back to Porky's, Mickey said firmly. Listen, Junior, after you go out there and he beats your ass again, then what are you going to do? Go back, Mickey said, and keep going back. Maybe you think that makes you a hero, little brother, but you're confusing bravery with stupidity. Ted told him calmly, Porky's a dangerous man. He's playing around now, but you keep going back there and he's going to get tired of you. Then he's going to hurt you. Bad. Mickey drew in a breath and held it, but said nothing. The clenched fists pressed against his sides did his talking for him. Ted looked at his brother's hands, then back up into his eyes and said, Am I going to have to take you home myself? Mickey was about to say one thing, caught himself, then blurted out, All right, I'll go home. Tonight, at least. Ted took a step back and watched Mickey climb up into his truck and start the engine. Easing down on the accelerator, he shifted into reverse, backed up to within a few inches of his brother's car, then quickly changed gears and popped the clutch. 
The pickup lunged forward with a shriek. Nicky jerked the steering wheel hard to his right and drove past Tommy Chevy and out of the parking lot. Goddamn redneck, Ted muttered to himself. Do you think he's really going back? Tommy asked him. Ted stared at the retreating taillight until it was gone from sight. Runs in the family, he said tonelessly. I just hope he lives to grow out of it. Chapter 11 Initiation Rights and Lefts Miss Ballbricker could smell lust in the gymnasium air. It cut through the aroma of sweating armpits and unwashed gym shorts and crusty socks. She smelled it the way a bloodhound falls on the scent of a fox who's just strayed from its den. She left her tumbling class doing push-ups on the mats and crossed the gymnasium floor, narrowing her small eyes as she sought out the source of that charged odor that had distracted her from her work. It was after school on Monday, and the gym was being simultaneously used by the tumbling class, the cheerleading squad, and the varsity basketball team. There were young bodies everywhere, and Ms. Ballbricker's quavering nostrils sorted through the commingling smells. These were all young heathens in heat, she knew, but somewhere there was someone whose pores were working overtime. She strode past the cheerleaders and lost the scent in the floral pungency of perfumes and hairsprays. Out near the opposite end of the court, Coach Goodenough was overseeing a scrimmage between the first and second string squads on the basketball team, and the air circulating there was rich and toxic, consisting of equal parts of sweat, bodily gas, and eau de sneakers. If there was lust to be found here, it was only a minute byproduct. Ms. Ballbricker looked up into the bleachers. Tommy Turner was wrapping an ace bandage around his knee while he talked to Wendy Williams, who was dressed in her cheerleader's uniform and lacing up a new shoestring on her tennis shoes. It looked innocent enough, but Ms. Ballbricker had been around a long time. She knew these kids would try to get away with anything, do anything to get the joy juice boiling through their perverted loins. Sure, they were sitting there in plain view, but who was to say they weren't priming each other up for some sin the first chance they got when no one was looking? See how Wendy was straddling the bleachers so her legs were spread? Miss Ballbricker shifted her course toward them. Who could be sure she was wearing anything under her cheerleading skirt? And Tommy had his knee bent enough that surely Wendy could see up his gym shorts if she only looked. Ah, yes, things aren't always as they seem, Miss Ballbricker gloated to herself, pleased at her olfactory prowess. Let them rut like hogs outside the gym, but no one was going to indulge themselves in the ways of damnation in her presence. Miss Ballbricker slowed down as she neared the bleachers and was suddenly alarmed. She whiffed the air deeply. Something was wrong. The scent was fading. She'd been led astray. Good afternoon, Miss Ballbricker, Tommy called down with icy politeness. Thank you so much for seeing to my suspension. My knee was in need of rest, and I'm sure I wouldn't have heeded its needs without you forcing me to. You're most considerate. There's no need for your sarcasm, Tommy Turner, Miss Ballbricker said. You should be grateful you'll have a chance to play at all this year. Of course, Miss Ballbricker, Tommy said, with a scornful smile fixed on his face. After I miss two games, I'm sure my knee will be just fine. The 2,000 laps were excellent therapy, too. Miss Ballbricker looked away from Tommy and frowned at Wendy. How long does it take you to tie your shoes anyway? You'll miss your drills. Yes, Miss Ballbricker, Wendy said. She stood up and began walking down the aisle to the floor. I was just waiting for Miss Honeywell to finish talking with Coach Brackett, that's all. Ms. Ballbricker's eyes flickered at the mention of Miss Honeywell and Coach Brackett. She saw where Wendy was looking and quickly jerked her head. 
Across the floor, Roy Brackett was hovering over Miss Honeywell as she lapped up water from the drinking fountain in the hallway leading to the locker rooms. Of course, Miss Ballbricker thought to herself as she strode across the court to her newfound prey. Lust emanated from the hallway, and Miss Ballbricker's nostrils flared at the scent. She was close to swooning with outrage. Roy was the first to see her coming, and he took a tentative step back from Miss Honeywell, who turned around from the cooler and faced him, letting a cool drop of water bead on her lower lip a moment before she sent her tongue out to herd it back into her mouth. Yes, Roy, she purred. You said you wanted to ask me something? Before Roy could say a word, Ms. Ballbricker swept into the hallway, hands on her hips, and situated herself between him and Miss Honeywell like a referee. She let her sullen gaze linger a moment on the telltale bulge in Roy's shorts, then shifted it to Miss Honeywell. The girls are waiting for you, Miss Ballbricker said. Miss Honeywell smiled at Roy before facing Miss Ballbricker. So nice of you to let me know, she replied glibly. I might have completely forgotten about them. Miss Honeywell blew Roy a mock kiss, then jogged away from him and Miss Ballbricker to join up with the cheerleaders. It took Roy all his concentration not to watch her go. I would think you'd set a moral example for the young men, Coach Brackett, Miss Ballbricker said sternly. They're in need of proper guidance, you know. Of course, Roy said meekly. He blushed as he turned from Miss Ballbricker, taking a drink from the cooler so that he could jiggle this waist to shift the extra load in his pants to a less conspicuous angle. Very well, then, Miss Ballbricker said. She took a final sniff of the air around Coach Brackett before turning heel and heading back to her tumbling students. That woman's got problems. Roy muttered to himself before turning his attention back to Miss Honeywell, who now had her back turned to him as she led the cheerleaders in jumping jacks. Roy felt the weight below his waist shift again as he watched the movement of Miss Honeywell's legs. Spread em, close em, spread em, close em, he whispered admiringly. He was so caught up in cheering her on that he didn't notice Coach Warren sidle up next to him. So how's Lassie? Warren asked. Lassie's fine, Roy said with exasperation. You, on the other hand, are going to be dead if you don't tell me why you call her Lassie. Coach Warren would only grin and point over his head to the upstairs equipment rooms. Yeah, yeah, Roy grumbled. I take her up there and everything will fall into place, right? Warren rounded his lips and strolled away, baying quietly. Roy shook his head with annoyance and went off in the other direction. He reached Coach Goodenough's side and joined him in watching the varsity team scrimmage. Pee-wee was bringing the ball in from half court, crouching over as he dribbled, staying clear of Frank Bell's feeble defense. Pee-wee faked in one direction, then switched hands and dribbled between his legs, changing course and catching Frank flat-footed. Don't be a hot dog, Pee-wee, Coach Goodenough called out. The Globetrotters aren't on our schedule this year. Pee-wee grinned and passed the ball over to Tim, who'd rushed forward from the baseline to the top of the key. Brian Schwartz was guarding him, and when Tim tried to fake to the left, Brian stabbed his hand forward, clearly tapping the ball away and stealing it from Tim. Nice move, Schwartz, Coach Goodenough called out from the sidelines. Brian dribbled back out to the top of the key and passed the ball off to Frank Bell as the second stringers took over the offense. When he resumed his position at the baseline, Brian found Tim hanging close to him and breathing harshly down his back. Gonna take more than a few lucky breaks to beat me out, Schwarzenheimer. Brian said nothing. He moved out from the basket and took a pass back from Frank Bell. Tim was right on him, waving his arms and blocking the baseline. Brian dribbled away from Tim, then bent his knees and looked up at the basket. Anticipating a jump shot, Tim leaped up to block the shot. Brian held back a second and waited until Tim was coming down before jumping and firing off the shot. It arched nicely and dropped through the net without even touching the rim. 
Oh, right, Brian, Frank cheered. Way to go. Brian grinned, pleased with himself. Tim eyed him with loathing as the ball went back out to Pee Wee and the first string set up its offense. They ran the same play as before, and this time when Tim got the ball, he faked twice, then dribbled into the shooting lane and attempted a right hook shot. Brian was right there, leaping up in front of him and batting the shot aside. Billy snatched it up for the second team and dribbled it out to Frank. Another nice one, Schwartz, Coach Brackett said. Goodenough cupped his hands over his mouth and added, Tim, you should have made sure you were clear on that shot. Pee-wee was open right in front of you. You could have passed to him and screened him for an easy shot. Heads up, ball. That's what we're looking for here. Tim kicked lightly at the court on his way back to his position. Sorry, Brian said, staying with him. What for? Tim snapped. You got lucky, but it was still a clean block. You may as well enjoy it while you can. I'll show you up real quick now. We'll see, Brian said. Frank brought the ball in on the other side by snapping a bounce pass past Pee-wee to Billy. Billy dribbled to the corner, glancing over his shoulder toward the shooting lane. Darby Collins, the second string center, was covered, but he took a step back and set up a pick for Brian, blocking out Tim. Brian swept around Darby, took the pass from Billy, then headed in for an easy layup. Tim pushed his way past Darby and managed to trip Brian in midstep. Brian lost the ball and fell down hard on the court, skimming his knees and forearm. Tim grabbed the stray ball and dribbled it out to the top of the key. Billy came over to help Brian up, and Coach Goodenough blew his whistle, stormed across the court, and shouted, All right, time out. He glared at Tim and pointed to the bench. Kavanaugh, get off the floor. Tim stopped dribbling the ball and looked at the coach innocently. Huh? Hey, it was just an accident, coach. I was covering him a little too close. Off the floor now, Goodenough interrupted. Don't hand me any excuses either. You're benched indefinitely. No one who plays that way plays for me. As Tim sulked over to the bench, Brian took a few steps to test his legs. All three coaches were watching him closely. I'll be all right, he assured them. You sure? Goodenough asked. When Brian nodded, he said, Okay, take Kavanaugh's place then. As practice resumed, Tim wiped his face off and spat angrily in his towel. He watched the others a few minutes, trying to keep his anger under control, then finally got up and trudged off the court to the locker room. By the time he showered and started to dress, the others began filing in. They were talking excitedly with one another until they spotted Tim. Then a silence came over the locker room. As the others undressed, Tim paced back and forth, trying to find an outlet for the rage that was building up inside him. Hey, any of you guys want to go out and fly a kite with me tonight? He shouted, staring hatefully over at Brian. I think it's great weather for kites. I wonder if there's any kites around here we could fly. Brian pulled off his practice jersey and came over to Tim, shaking his head to himself. Listen, Kavanaugh, he said calmly. It's not kite, it's kike. K-I-K-E, kike. You want to be a bigot? The least you could do is get your slurs right. Tommy and Billy were right there, and they moved in to grab Tim as he lunged after Brian. He tried to shake them off, but they pinned him back against his locker. Get your ass dressed, Jew boy, Tim shouted at Brian. Let's sell this out back. Brian looked at Tim emotionlessly, then nodded his head. If that's what you want, you're damn right it's what I want, Tim roared, heading for the door. I'll be waiting. The atmosphere in the locker room remained subdued while the rest of the team showered and changed. Brian kept to himself, but Billy eventually came over and said, If you want, I can talk to Tim. He's probably cooled off by now. No sense blowing this up any more than it already is. We could use you both on the team. Brian shook his head. I don't expect other people to fight my battles for me. Tim can be rough, Billy warned. I can handle myself, Brian said calmly. Ten minutes later, he was proving it. Most of the team gathered behind the gym to watch as Tim and Brian went at it on the same patch of lawn where boys had been settling their differences for the past 50 years.
The two opponents slowly circled each other, feinting in and out, taking short jabs as they sized each other up. The others were quiet for the most part. They hadn't come to root for either side. They just wanted to make sure things were settled as cleanly as possible, with neither party being hurt too much. Tim finally took the offensive and charged Brian with a sweeping roundhouse right. Brian leaned away from the fist as it passed inches from his head. Before Tim could pull his arm back, Brian landed a few left jabs against Tim's jaw. Kavanaugh staggered back, stunned. He rubbed his jaw, breathing heavily, then rushed back, flailing his fists madly. Only a few of the punches grazed Brian, who weaved in and out and was more selective and successful with his parries. The other players looked to one another with surprise. The unspoken odds had been with Tim, but it was clear that Brian easily outmatched him. Tim's nose was bleeding slightly by the time he abandoned boxing and moved in toward Brian with both arms outstretched, as if he hoped to wrestle him to the ground and choke him. Brian sidestepped Tim's charge. At the same time, he slapped a firm grip on Tim's wrists. Before Tim knew what was happening, Brian flung him effortlessly to the ground. Tim landed on his back and almost lost his wind, but he staggered to his feet and stubbornly headed back toward Brian, who had bounded back up and whirled around, cocking his arms in a martial arts stance. Tim was about to lunge forward for another beating when someone pushed past the other players and grabbed him from behind. It was Roy Brackett. All right, Tim, the coach said forcefully. That's enough. Knock it off. Tim struggled against Roy's hold a few seconds, then stood still. Okay, okay, he conceded bitterly. Let me go. It's over, Roy warned him. Yeah, it's over, Tim muttered. Roy let him go, and Tim wiped away a trickle of blood from his nose with a handkerchief. For all the beating he'd taken, that was the only visible injury, aside from a few grass stains. Brian came forward and extended his hand to Tim. Settled? he asked sincerely. Tim looked down at Brian's hand, turned without shaking it, and walked off, holding the handkerchief to his face. Okay, show's over, Roy told the other players. As Brian headed for the parking lot, Billy and Tommy fell in beside him. Where'd you learn to fight like that? Billy asked. If you're Jewish, either you learn to fight or you take a lot of shit, Brian said, flexing his fingers, which were sore from the fight. I don't like to take shit, so I learned how to box and studied a little jujitsu. Jujitsu? Tommy asked, confused. J-U, Brian said with a smile. You know, like karate. There's always ads for it in the comic books. All right, the Japanese stuff, Billy said. How often have you had to use it? Jujitsu? Today was the first time, actually, Brian admitted. They walked quietly a ways, then Billy said, You're looking good out there on the court, too. It looks like we got ourselves a new starting forward. Thanks, Brian said. I just wish it wasn't by default. You guys think the coach will stick to his suspending Kavanaugh? Hard to say, Tommy said. Either way, you're the better player. Look, Brian, Billy said, Tim's got a lot of problems to work out, but he's still our buddy. Him and Mickey... They've both got short fuses, but once you get to know them, you can tell they're basically good guys. I've only got the rest of this year, Brian said with a grin. When they reached the parking lot, he told them, Look, I gotta go. See you guys tomorrow. If you aren't doing anything tonight, you might drop by the deadbeat, Tommy suggested. We're going to grab some chow there and then cruise over to work on the float. Homecoming's almost here, you know. I'll think about it, Brian said. Then he wandered off to his car. Peewee caught up with Tommy and Billy. Hey, that Brian's something else, huh? Yeah, Tommy said. He seems like a nice guy. I wouldn't want to have to put up with what he must have to, though. Hey, Peewee, Billy asked. How's your grandmother anyway? She's fine, just fine, Peewee said happily. Just bonked her head on a beam while she was moving stuff. Had a headache for a few hours, and that was it. Peewee sure had been relieved when he heard that last night. What's more, his mother hadn't mentioned anything about his secret archives. Apparently, his grandmother hurt herself before she stumbled across them. Pee-wee had told his mother he'd made a point to go out over the weekend to help Grandma clean the attic, even if it was homecoming. His mother had praised him for his selflessness. He told her he'd just like to help out. Crisis averted. 
Now he figured he'd find a better hiding place for the magazines. Maybe the trunk of his Crosley. As they headed for their cars, Billy muttered, If that jujitsu works, maybe I ought to send away for the book on it. Tommy squeezed Billy's bicep and said, Try the Charles Atlas one first, Samson. Pee-wee mumbled, Don't bother, it doesn't work. Take it from one who knows, huh, Pee-wee? Billy laughed. Chapter 12, Chili with Meat. The float was coming along nicely until Meat showed up. The seniors had managed to complete the lettering around the float skirt, and both Pee-wee and Tommy were standing on ladders, adding the last bits of tissue to their sculpted representative riding the porpoise. Hey, he kind of looks like Mickey, don't you think? Pee-wee asked Tommy as he looped a wad of Kleenex through the chicken wire of the figure's large head. Nah, Tommy said. Look how much bigger his head is than the rest of his body. Put glasses on him and pull up his pants and he'd be a dead ringer for high pockets. Marvin looked up and cracked. Why don't you just leave the head with plenty of holes in it and then it could be either one of you. You guys, Beth Ann complained. Don't you ever give it a rest? Depends on how much it gets used, Tommy joked. Seeing that Beth Ann was looking the other way, he put his hand over his crotch and stroked the air in front of it. Marvin never gives it a rest. Marvin was about to retort when the door to the warehouse swung open and banged against the wall. Meat stood in the doorway. His knees were wobbling and he had a glazed look on his face. Jesus, Meat, Tommy cried out. What the hell happened to you? Meat belched lightly and held up his hand. He was carrying a beer can. He shook it lightly, then turned it upside down. Only a few drops spilled out. It's all gone, he blubbered, letting go of the can and lurching forward. Propelled by sheer momentum, he weaved a drunken course past several of the girls and collided with Marvin. Marvin, in turn, was knocked backwards into the ladder supporting Pee-wee. Oh, shit, Pee-wee hollered as the ladder teetered under him. Reaching for support, he managed to grab hold of an overhead rafter as the ladder toppled onto the float. The chicken wire student broke in half at the waist, and his upper torso plummeted to the ground with the ladder. As Pee-wee swung from the rafters, kicking his legs out and looking down, Beth Ann screamed up at him, Hold on, Edward! Don't fall, or you'll land on the float and ruin everything! I don't have a good grip! Pee-wee howled frantically. Somebody do something. Move the float, Marvin said as he stepped over Meat, who had slumped to the ground on top of a heap of unused chicken wire. Tommy hurried down from his ladder and helped Marvin and Billy push the float out from under Pee-wee. The girls, in the meantime, dragged the huge carton of tissue over so that Pee-wee was dangling directly over it. Okay, Beth Ann called up. It's safe now. Pee-wee looked down at his target and screamed, are you kidding me? That box is half empty. Don't be such a pessimist, Marvin called up to him. It looks half full to me. Come on, it's only a ten-foot drop for crying out loud. Billy laughed. Pretend you're in the Olympic muff dive competition. William McCarty, Beth Ann said, shocked. You are so vulgar. He can't help it, Tommy told Beth Ann. His parents are vulgarian. I'm about to break my legs, and you guys are cracking jokes, Pee-wee snarled. Oh, jump already, Pee-wee, Tommy said. Geronimo, Billy shouted. Pee-wee let go of the rafter and dropped neatly inside the tissue carton. Two points for Morris, Tommy announced in his sportscaster voice. Angel Beach takes the lead. Pee-wee stood up in the box and kicked out the weakest wall. Hey, joke about it now, but if I wasn't so coordinated, I could have been out for the season. With Pee-wee safely on the ground, everyone moved over to check on Meat, who had passed out on the chicken wire and was snoring loudly. You're a real help, Marvin complained to Meat. You set us back half a day on the float, I hope you realize. I don't think he's listening to you, Marvin, Beth Ann said. I don't get it, Billy said. It's the middle of the week, with a big game coming up, no less. This isn't like meat at all. Oh, wait a second. Tommy bent over and reached for an envelope sticking out of meat's pocket. He pulled out the letter inside and shook his head as he read it. What is it? Pee-wee asked. Meat got turned down by Princeton. 
Amidst the assortment of groans and moans, Beth Ann let out a short laugh and said, He apply to Princeton? Sure, why not? Pee Wee asked. Still laughing to herself, Beth Ann led a few of the other girls over to see if they could salvage the dismembered torso of the figure that Meat had indirectly tackled, Ruby Goldberg style. Meat, wake up, Tommy said, nudging his immobile friend. Meat stirred slightly, very slightly. We gotta do something, Pee Wee said. He looked around the room, then went to a wash basin near the door and filled a cup with cold water. He brought it back, poised himself over meat, but stopped short of pouring water in his face. Come on, what are you waiting for? Billy asked. I can't do it, Pee Wee said. He'd kill me. Pee Wee, he's not going to even know what hit him, Billy said. For all he knows, it could be raining. Yeah, I guess so. Pee Wee splashed the water onto Meat's face and tossed the cup aside as if it were on fire. Meat jerked himself awake, sputtering for air and blinking his eyes. Uh-huh. The others moved away from him as he slowly set up on the chicken wire, groaning as he grabbed his head. It's okay, Meat, Billy told him. You're among friends. You didn't kill anyone, at least not that we know about. Meat squinted and put a hand over his brow to block out the glare of the overhead light. As the room came into focus for him, he began to remember why he was drunk. Fuckers wouldn't take me, he said, his voice slurred. Hey, who needs a bunch of Ivy League jerks anyway, Tommy told him. You'll be better off in the Big Ten. You need some coffee, Billy suggested. Let's go hit the deadbeat. Some coffee and a bowl of Red Devil chili, and we'll burn off all that booze. You'll be good as new. Meat bobbed his head up and down and mumbled, Coffee. Marvin deserted the cause and went to help the girls, while Pee-wee, Tommy, and Billy helped Meat to his feet and led him outside. I don't see his car, Billy said. He must have walked, Tommy said. How about if we drive him over in yours? We can hang his head out the window in case he barfs. Your car needs a new paint job anyway. They propped Meat up in the front seat, and miraculously he made it as far as the deadbeat parking lot before he got sick. Pee-wee hurriedly opened the door, and Meat crawled out on all fours and lost his lunch in the bushes behind the outdoor tables. a boy, Meat, Tommy cheered him on. Get it all out of your system. Make room for that chili. Meat was able to stand up and make it back from the bushes on his own two feet, but Tommy and Billy quickly moved in to prop him up from either side. As they made their way toward the back entrance, Pee-wee looked in and saw Wendy sitting with Phyllis and Mindy at the counter. Hot damn, he said, rubbing his hands together. This'll be perfect. Huh? Meat mumbled. What are you talking about, Pee-wee? Give us a hand here, why don't ya? Billy complained. Pee-wee looked excitedly at Tommy and asked, Hey, you want to get back at Wendy? You owe her one, right? Yeah, but I, well, I got a plan, Pee-wee said. If it has anything to do with flies and honey. No, man, this one is really great. Look, all you got to do is talk to the waitress at the counter and tell her to make sure Wendy answers the phone when it rings. Say what? Meek grumbled dully, his eyes half closed. What happens then? Tommy wanted to know. You'll find out, Pee-wee said. Just go do it. Tommy leaned forward and looked past Meat at Billy. Billy shrugged his shoulders. They went ahead, leading Meat inside, while Pee-wee went over to the payphone and searched through his pockets for change. He looked in through the window and saw Tommy take the waitress aside and whisper something in her ear. The waitress frowned with confusion at first, but nodded her head after Tommy whispered something else. Pee-wee fed the phone and dialed a number, trying to restrain his enthusiasm. I'm gonna get her, I'm gonna get her. Inside the diner, the phone on the wall next to the counter suddenly rang. The waitress was over at the soda fountain filling drink orders and she called out, hey Wendy, can you get that for me? As Wendy leaned over the counter and grabbed the phone, Tommy and Billy watched her from a few stools over, keeping their grins to themselves. Meat was hunched over the counter. He looked as if he were waiting for his chili to climb on a spoon and jump into his mouth for him. Deadbeat diner, Wendy said into the receiver. Pee-wee disguised his voice and answered, Hi, I'm looking for a friend of mine. He's supposed to be there. Can you see if he's still there for me? 
Yeah, well, what's his name? Wendy asked. His name is Michael Hunt. Pee Wee pronounced the name separately and distinctly. Mike Hunt. All right, just a second. Wendy cupped her hand over the receiver and shouted out, Is Mike Hunt here? The diner was crowded and all around people looked up at Wendy. A few of them smiled knowingly. Is Mike Hunt here? Wendy asked again, raising her voice. Phone call from Mike Hunt. Tommy laughed under his breath. I didn't know it could talk. Huh? Wendy said, looking all around the diner to see if anyone was coming to take the call. Hey, has anybody seen Mike Hunt? There were laughs all through the diner now, but Wendy still hadn't caught on. Meat had perked up for a moment. He stared oddly at Wendy and said, I thought everyone had. Wendy asked him, You've seen my cunt? I never even heard the guy. Meat let out a drunken snort, and Billy had to reach out to keep him from falling off his stool. Wendy reached over for the microphone by the cash register and called out over the outside intercom. Would Mike Hunt please report to the main counter? Mike Hunt. It hit her at the same time she looked outside and saw Pee Wee grinning at her from the payphone, pointing between his legs and mouthing the words, My Cunt. It was one of the oldest jokes around and he tripped her up on it. I'll get you, Pee Wee, she told him over the phone. You little prick. And I mean that literally. As Wendy hung up the phone, a light round of applause sounded through the diner. Wendy took a slight bow, then slipped back into her stool and looked down at Tommy. You put him up to this, didn't you? Tommy shook his head. It was all his doing. He was the mastermind. I just set up the waitress. Likely story. Pee Wee came in from the back and hopped up onto his stool, keeping five people between himself and Wendy. He waved to Brian, who was standing in the front doorway, looking for his classmates. When he joined them, the first thing Brian noticed was Meat missing his mouth with a spoonful of chili. Meat lowered his face closer to the bowl and tried again, this time with slightly better results. What's got into Meat? Brian asked. I didn't think he drank during the week. He normally doesn't. Billy explained as he noticed two uniformed police officers coming into the diner and walking over to the takeout counter. It's just that he found out today that he wasn't accepted at Princeton. Princeton? Brian said. Meat doesn't have the grades for Princeton, does he? Besides, I thought he had scholarship offers from at least 60 other colleges. Yeah, I know, but for some reason he had his heart set on Princeton. It was a real letdown. Oh, well, hey, Brian, glad you could make it. Tommy said, pull up a chair. Try some of the chili if you've got a cast iron stomach. Let me just use the bathroom a second, Brian said. I'll be right back. As Brian headed off for the back hallway, Meat dropped his spoon on the counter and sped a mouthful of chili back into his bowl. This chili tastes like shit, he complained loudly. Glancing over at the cops, Billy grimaced. They were looking back and taking note of Meat. Billy turned to warn Meat to watch himself, but it was too late. Meat's lights went out. He slumped forward and pounded his forehead loudly on the countertop. Oh, shit, Tommy swore under his breath, reaching over to hold Meat on his stool. Across the way, the two officers looked at one another, then started over. Thinking fast, Billy stood up and said, Pee-wee, could you give me some of those sugar cubes at the end of the counter? What for? Pee-wee asked. Just do it, Billy said. Pee-wee noticed the officers for the first time and scrambled down from his stool to carry out Billy's request. The two men stopped when they reached the counter. One of them pointed at Meat and asked, That boy been drinking? As Pee-wee returned with the sugar cubes, Billy politely explained, Oh no, sir, officer, our friend here is a diabetic. Tommy caught on and took the cubes from Pee-wee, and matching Billy's pompous formality, he said, Thank you, Edward, for bringing Anthony some sugar. He looked at Billy. How many cubes of sugar does your cousin require when he's had too much insulin? Two cubes of sugar usually brings Anthony around, Billy replied. Tommy raised Meat's head and carefully pried his mouth open long enough to insert the sugar. Meat growled and spit the cubes out, then promptly passed out again, this time landing face first in his bowl with so much force that chili shrapnel sprayed everywhere. 
a kidney bean landed on the nose of one of the officers and leaked juice down his face. The high schoolers froze and watched for the officer's reaction. Pee Wee found himself wishing he'd ended up being shipped out to a seminary. If these guys were anything like the cops at Porky's, he and the others would be working the rock pile at some juvenile home by this time tomorrow. Here it was, the turning point in his life. It was all downhill from here. Fifty years from now, he'd be rotting away in some prison, and when some young punk was shoved in to share his cell and asked him how he came to end up a lifer, he'd shake his head sadly and whisper mournfully, it all began with a bowl of chili. But these were not Wallace Town authorities. They were Angel Beach officers with teenagers of their own. They both remained calm as they surveyed the situation. The cop with chili on his face nonchalantly flicked the bean off his nose and dabbed the smear clean with a napkin from the counter. His partner looked down at Neat, who still had his face planted in the bowl. Gee, I never saw anybody drown in a bowl of chili before, he commented. Me either, the other officer said blandly. I wouldn't even know how to fill out the forms on that. Yeah, you're right. It'd be a lot of hassle. I guess we better save him. Yeah, we better. The second officer reached over, grabbed Meat by the hair, and gently pulled his face out of the chili. Meat was a mess, still out cold. The first cop said, Gee, I'm not a doctor, but I could swear this youngster is inebriated. Oh, no, sir, Tommy protested hopefully. He's well now. If you all say he's a diabetic and we find out he's drunk, we'd have to book the whole lot of you as accessories. Pee Wee blurted out, he's drunk. Definitely, Billy concurred just as quickly. Son of a bitch does it all the time, Pee Wee said. Billy kicked him in the shins to keep him from going overboard as the others looked at Pee Wee with anger. Suddenly, Brian excused his way past Tommy and Billy to address the officers. Pardon me, but I couldn't help but notice what's happening here, he said. Who are you? The first officer asked him. Just a bystander. Brian Schwartz is the name. Unlike Billy and Tommy, Brian's straight man delivery was totally credible and unexaggerated. Now, I don't know if it's any help, but I ever heard this poor fellow mention that he'd gotten drunk because he'd just broken up with his girlfriend tonight. Tell me, gentlemen, wouldn't you be inclined to toss back a few if the woman you love turned her back on you? The officers looked at one another dubiously. One of them chuckled. Hell, if my wife left me, I'd get drunk for joy. The other cop laughed as well. Brian snickered lightly, and taking the cue, so did Tommy and Billy. All right, the first officer said, looking back at me. Just get him out of here and take him home. Thanks, officer, Tommy said. We'll do that. The waitress came over and handed the officers their takeout orders. When the men left, Tommy and Billy turned to Brian and patted him on the back. Slick move, Bry. You are one smooth mover, Schwartz. Brian shrugged his shoulders modestly. Hey, I did what I could. You saved our necks, Pee Wee added. Wendy came over and snickered. <laughs> Gee, Brian, maybe I'll start a lottery at school to see what girl gets to go with you to homecoming. You haven't asked anyone yet, have you? Well, no, Brian said, suddenly flustered. I know for a fact that there's at least a half dozen girls who'd love to go with you, Wendy said. You're only a senior once, Brian. You can't waste time being shy. Pee Wee butted in. Hey, Wendy, why don't you set me up? Before Wendy could think of a comeback, Frank Bell rushed in the back entrance and pushed his way through the crowd. When he reached the others, he said breathlessly, Hey, you guys better come quick. Mickey's just pulled in and he's been beat to shit. Porky's, Billy said. That damn fool. Frank and Tommy quickly transferred meat from the counter to a booth where he had less chance of falling in his sleep. Then they all charged out the back door into the parking lot. Mickey's pickup had lost another headlight, and there was a massive crack across the front windshield. The door to the driver's side was hanging open, and Mickey was slouched haphazardly behind the wheel with one leg hanging out of the truck. His shirt was ripped, and his face was swollen and bleeding. He had a twisted grin on his blood-caked lips as he peered up at the others through puffy eyes. Some bitch broke his hand, I bet, Mickey cackled drunkenly. <laughs> Showed him good. You sure did, Billy said cynically. Jesus, you've been through the goddamn grinder, Mickey, Pee Wee shouted. Mickey started to get out of the truck, but his legs gave out and he collapsed. Tommy and Billy caught him and eased him down to the ground. 
Pee-wee, go call Ted right away, Billy said. As Pee-wee rushed to the phone, Billy turned to Tommy and said, I hate to take him to the hospital, but I guess we better. Let's get him in your car, Tommy said. Hospital? Mickey murmured, coming back to his senses. You're hurt, man, Billy said. Your face is all busted to hell and... As if he'd been plugged into an electric circuit, Mickey suddenly bolted upright, pushed away his friends, and laughed like a madman. I'm not going to no hospital, man. What's the matter with you guys? Mickey. Mickey ignored Billy's plea and climbed hastily back into his truck. Before anyone could stop him, he started up the engine and floored the accelerator. The lightless vehicle plunged out into the street and veered wildly before Mickey brought it under control. Shit, I hope those cops get to him before he kills himself, Tommy said as the pickup vanished in the late night traffic. I'm going to have to babysit with him, Billy said. Tommy shook his head sadly and said, that won't stop him.